Salutations. Proponents of Abrahamic religions and of post-Abrahamic New Age spiritualism have an altogether bizarre conception of what is called the soul, which is so strange when looked at from an external perspective that many cultures have had to have new words introduced to their languages in order to even express the concept when they were converted. What is that? What is that? It is no wonder that people who have not been thus indoctrinated will balk at the notion that inside their body is a veritable ghost containing an exact replica of their personality, appearance, and all of their memories, which is created but indestructible, malleable while they live, yet immortal when they die, and irreducible into component parts. Needless to say, these opinions are not found among the philosophers. Plato artfully attributed the behaviour of human beings to three distinct sources, which he called epithumeticon, thumeticon, and logisticon. In Phaedrus, Plato compares this tripartite construct to a chariot being pulled by two horses. The first two principles are the horses, which drive passionately towards their respective desires. The third is the charioteer, whose duty is to guide the horses with precision and discernment. This is established through the observation of natural human behaviour and the extrapolation of principles. As he says in the Republic, The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. And therefore, whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same but different. And we may once more appeal to the words of Homer, which have already been quoted by us. He smote his breast, and thus rebuked his soul. For in this verse, Homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreasoning anger which is rebuked by it. Human beings can have conflicting desires. It is possible for a thirsty man to refuse a drink, or for an angry man to quell his passions and refuse to act upon them. Therefore, the elements within a human being that produce the desires and the element that formulates decisions are separate and distinct entities. So what are these three forces that inhabit the human creature? Where do they come from? What do they do? What happens to them when we die? What are you? Let's first try to define what the three are and what behaviours they govern, from lowest to highest. And as always, by Jove, it wouldn't be proper if I didn't list a range of other cultures and civilizations whose wise men have come to parallel conclusions. If you're interested, I will also leave a link in the description to another video on this topic by a much more qualified YouTuber. The first element is, to put it simply, the body and those passions that arise from it. Physical urges, physical sensations, and physical identity are intertwined with, and produced by, the biological vehicle in which the human mind operates. This is the autopilot, what people commonly associate with the reptilian brain. It emerges from the clay of the earth and ultimately returns there. Your favourite food, your favourite drink, your gender, sexuality, your crippling cocaine addiction, these belong to the body alone, and all of them perish when the body does. Who's laughing now? On this account, it is a grave and terrible error to identify with these things. If your sense of personal identity revolves around these materialistic things, I am a man! I'm stoned. I'm gay. I am a wolf. I am the liquor. Then your true self will remain perpetually lost as your illusory sense of self is dissolved again and again, an endless fall into mindless, bestial degeneracy that will gradually be stripped of all coherent thought and be left in a zombie-like stupor. Must register for semester. The Chinese philosophers called this spirit Po and associated it with the dark, chthonic, earthly energy of Yin. The Egyptians called it Khet, and the mummified remains of their kings were considered to represent a vehicle for the soul, like a living body during life. In India, it is associated with the quality of Tamas, being stagnant, dark, passive, almost corpse-like. Well, that's one down, two to go. The second horse pulling our proverbial chariot is the Thumeticon, which is possibly the most difficult to understand for the modern normie. It is as much a companion as a component of the person in question. It is invested in the world, both genetically and socially, but it transcends physical phenomena in that it can manifest in either mode and across disparate generations. It is the source of the immaterial passions, of the desire for honour, glory, friendship, power, justice, and the pursuit of the liberal arts. People possessed by their Thumeticon are passionate, courageous, sentimental, competitive, romantic, and prone to outrage. 
The Thumeticon also intervenes independently of the individual. Whether it participates in consciousness as it does so, it cannot be said, but certainly it is possessed of a capacity for apparent thought, perhaps in the same way a computer can imitate the illusion of thought through its electrical processes. Greek and Roman heathens would appeal to their family daimon, or tutelary spirit, from which we obtain the modern word demon the meaning of which has been corrupted by Christianity. And he was just, I mean, literally like a demon creature out of hell. This had a connection to the cult of the ancestors and was thought of as a kind of spiritual inheritance that belonged to the head of the household, the pater familias, who was also the priest or spiritual authority of a family unit. For this reason, the Romans called their familial daimon genius, which is related to genes, as in DNA or blood. On many occasions, when Socrates was about to do something, a certain presence would impose on his mind and turn him against that course of action. This presence remained with him throughout his life and advised him against actions which he later discovered would have been disastrous. This entity was referred to as a daimon. The viewer is probably vaguely familiar with terms such as totem, spirit animal, and familiar. The Thumeticon lies at the core of these animistic beliefs, as well as the Australian Aboriginal conception of the personal dreaming, which is connected to one's clan ancestors. In Chinese folk religion, the ancestor spirits are also represented as animals. The Germanic peoples told of what is called Filgia in Old Norse, a spirit in the form of an animal that is passed down from ancestor to descendant. People belonging to noble bloodlines were possessed of a potent filgia, taking the form of a powerful creature such as a bear, but all people were understood to possess a filgia of some kind. The filgia was closely associated with one's personality traits, and many children were named after deceased grandparents or famous ancestors, so that they would inherit their filgia and by extension their virtues. Thus the spirit would be sustained down the generations. This is also reminiscent of how many old European families have crests that represent their bloodlines, many of which feature animals. The Sanskrit word manyu refers both to a spirit in the literal sense and to powerful expressions of outrage, grief, or passionate zeal, and is also related to the Persian word mainyu, meaning a spirit, which you might know from Zoroastrianism. In Vedic philosophy, the properties of the Thumeticon fall under the quality of rajas, the dynamic, fiery passion and energy. The esoteric tradition of Hermeticism, which originated in Greco-Roman Egypt and persisted in Western alchemy and occult philosophy, also had a tripartite conception of the self. I will leave a link in the description to a lecture about alchemy that explores the symbolism associated with this. The veneration of one's ancestors, among other things, fosters the development of one's tribal thumeticoi, and the encouragement of this practice among one's descendants confers obvious benefits for the elder. This can be compared to the traditional Christian practice of venerating saints who are possessed of persistent thumeticoi thanks to this veneration, and therefore, as it is said, can be called upon for assistance through intercessory prayer. To invest one's identity in the Thumeticon is certainly a path to transcend bodily death so long as future generations retain and continue to feed their ancestral spirit, but ultimately it is in error, although obviously to a far lesser degree than the material attachment. I sexually identify as an attack helicopter. So that's it for the horses pulling our chariot. If you've been paying attention, you already know the identity of the driver. The Logisticon is consciousness itself, the intellectual principle, the highest order of intelligible reality. It is a unique, microscopic instance of the unlimited nous. In Chinese philosophy, this is called Hun, and is regarded as the polar opposite of the Po, having a Yang nature rather than a Yin nature. The Egyptians called it Ach, a concept they associated with light as well as intellect. In Sanskrit, it is called Atman, and it has the quality of Sattva, placid, lofty, pure, contemplative. As you might have guessed from the name, this principle is associated with logic, rational thoughts that seem counterintuitive to the other principles and go against the blind gratification of the body or passions arise from the logisticon. It also has contact with the universal forms, as described in the third video in this series. It is the true seat of individual identity. This is what is truly meant by I. So what implications does all this stuff have for notions of the afterlife? 
Well, first off, you can throw Abrahamic ideas about an eternal heaven and hell into the nearest bin, along with the nihilistic oblivion of the Epicureans. In fact, the apparently separated Logisticon passes continuously through different states of being as new matter participates in the forms of the intellectual principle, in a process of transmigration that lasts so long as it maintains the illusion of separation from the highest. Our next video will be entirely about this concept of metempsychosis, what exactly it entails and why it begins and how it can end. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. And you're like, is this comedy? This is not comedy.